to know where you, who you are now and, and who you are as a society, it's important to know where you came from and how you link to link to the past. And uh, Thomas Muir, he's a local person. He's brought up in a, 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 a Glasgow family. His father uh, is, is uh, a shopkeeper in the high street, uh, James Muir. But eventually he acquired enough money that he was able to buy uh, the, the, the Bonnet Laird's house of Hunters Hill. When Thomas Muir lived here, Scotland's political landscape was very different. Two parties, the Tories and the Whigs, held the balance of power and the only way you could vote was if you owned land. Muir was always radicalised by his background. His, his family were devout members of the Old Lechkirk, which believed the uh, congregation were the people who should choose who the minister was. None of this patronage nonsense of uh, the big landlords deciding to put their person in the pulpit as a, as a control mechanism. Because he was so able uh, as an advocate, uh, he managed to get the congregation's choice of minister uh, uh, confirmed for the local Cadder church. So in this area, he was a bit of a hero with some people. As a young man, Muir went to university in Glasgow, where he got involved in radical politics. He had originally gone to Glasgow University. They started them young then. He started at the age of 10. And, and by the uh, age of 17, he was going to study theology. But he then fell under the influence of Professor John Miller at Glasgow University. So he then comes up within the Faculty of Advocates as a reforming lawyer, as somebody who will do pro bono cases and will take on uh, cases which otherwise uh, the people would be left without any legal representation. He was very focused. He always managed to get hold of an issue. He got involved in university politics uh, to such a degree that eventually in 1785 he had to transfer from uh, Glasgow to Edinburgh to complete his degree. In the early 1790s the Friends of the People are begun in England. They're inspired by the French Revolution but they are not looking, the friends of the people, to have an out-and-out -out revolution or rebellion. What they want is gradual democratic reform. They want a peaceful process. And in 1792 to 93, they become particularly active in Scotland. And Thomas Muir is at the forefront of their meetings in Edinburgh. As the French Revolution got underway across the English Channel, the British establishment started to sweat. Radicals like Thomas Muir, who were campaigning for universal suffrage, were becoming a real threat to the traditional order. He was very much against people that use violence for political uh, protest, and he was appalled at the idea uh, that the French were about to uh, execute their King Louis the Sixteenth, you know, that, that really appalled Thomas Muir. So he went off to France really ostensibly to join in the voice against uh, this execution that was clearly going to happen. Muir tries to prevent this meltdown by going over to France, but of course he gets there too late. The, by the time he's, he's there, war has been declared, uh, the ports are shut. By the time he gets to Paris, it's the day of the execution of the king, so nothing can be done. It's all cut and dry. Muir had already been charged with sedition, the crime of promoting rebellion, before he went to France. When the king of France is killed, the ports are shut and Muir can't get back for his trial date. When he eventually does return, he's arrested and thrown into jail. There are a number of show trials of reform-minded men in the period 1793 to 1795. And in Edinburgh, um, we have the eyes of Britain turned on the capital of Scotland because there Muir and a small number of others end up being transported to Botany Bay. Now, most of these others are transported for seven years. Muir is sentenced to 14 years, virtually a death sentence in the normal run of things and very much on trumped up charges. Uh, he escapes uh, across the Pacific to uh, Monterey and then he, he ends up uh, in Cuba where he's imprisoned. This is a man who has adventures all over the world, in France, Australia, South America, North America, 
who has half his face blown off in a sea battle. This is a man who has one of the most remarkable of all Scottish lives. He ends up going uh, to, to Cadiz, he's sent to Cadiz and uh, to Madrid to be interrogated. Uh, and the French government intervene on his behalf and he's made an honorary citizen of France. Muir died on the 26th of January, 1799. He was just 33. Thomas Muir stands out as a quite iconic figure. A man who had the guts to stand up for what he believed in. He defended himself at his trial. He spoke out very clearly on behalf of the rights not only of Scottish and English and Welsh people, but also quite dangerously in a sense, um, he spoke out in favour of the Irish in the 1790s, which then as now was quite a kind of political hot potato. So this is a man who organises, who speaks on behalf of greater rights. This year, a series of events will be held across Scotland to celebrate the 250th anniversary of his birth. While few Scots will spare a thought for Thomas Muir when they cast their vote next month, the importance of the role he played will not be forgotten. How relevant is democracy? How relevant is uh, the history of that? It's uh, in a local context, like, absolutely. In a national context within Scotland, absolutely. Within a British context, he was certainly, if you look at the Four Nations, certainly in a Scottish context, but England had its own like, parliamentary reform movement going, as did Ireland. So it's, he's integral within that story. But then on an international scale, you had like, the American Revolution, you had revolution happening in France, democracy happening within, like, on, on a global scale. So Thomas Muir's part of that. Like, he's one of the... He's one of the pioneers, he's one of the, he's the father, he's one of the fathers of, of what we regard as, as democracy.